I'm Jamie Frith. I'm the Performance Director with the Guernsey Sports Commission. Um, Rachel, an educational psychologist with the Education Department. Um, I'm going to apologise at the start. Ken Robinson once said, there are two types of people in this world, those that divide the world into two types of people and those that don't. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're going to do the former and simplistically divide the world into two types of people. Um, this is a project that started actually in sport with the Guernsey Sports Commission, um, and then I got seconded to work with Rachel um, in education for a day a week, and we're just over two years now into a three-year project, which I think is going to hopefully end, going to end up being extended. Um, how I got into it um, was actually through sport, um, and it was coming back here coaching and coming across these very able young people who, when they experienced any sort of failure, I heard the most ridiculous excuses. And I thought, well, what is going wrong with these people that seemingly have this robust confidence, yet every time something goes at all wrong, or they experience any sort of challenge, run away from it and crumple? So when I came across Carol Dweck's work, it started to give me an understanding of what was going on, but most importantly, what to do about it. OK, so Carol Dweck is the lady with the dark hair in this photograph, sitting with Jeremy and I on a stage up in Scotland. Um, she is a professor of psychology at Stanford University and has spent the last oh, 30 years at least researching why some people are motivated, in particular children, to learn and to push themselves and to achieve their best, and why some people are not. And what she, she talks about, she asks the question, what do we believe, and belief is an important word here, about our intelligence, and our abilities. Do we believe they're things that we're born with a certain amount of, and that's pretty much fixed and can't change? Or do we believe that our intelligence, our abilities, basic qualities about us can change and grow? So she talks about, she's coined two different phrases, a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And a fixed mindset would be your entity belief that things can't really change. Things about you're born with a certain amount of intelligence, and that's it. In a growth mindset, your belief, and again, it's not right or not wrong, it's a belief, okay. that your intelligence, your abilities can change and grow. And from these two different mindsets, which we're not going to go into too much depth about now, um, you can read the book or Google some things and find out more, but from these come very different behaviours, and we're just going to quickly talk through what those different behaviours are. OK, so I'm going to be in a fixed mindset. And I believe that intelligence, abilities, talents, whatever it might be, personality is fixed and can't change. So, given a challenge, I'm going to avoid it. Okay? Because if I believe that my talents, intelligence, abilities, whatever it is, are fixed, and I experience any sort of failure, that means I'm a failure. Failure is final because I believe that I can't change. Um, I'm also going to believe that scores on a, on a test would predict potential, and where I am now will predict where I'm going to end up in the future. Um, the success of others is a massive threat because I'm drawn into comparisons, okay? I'm in, drawn into compa comparing myself to others. It's about establishing superiority, so being the best in the class, the best in the island, which is what I generally heard in cricket and football and lots of other sports. Um, and then if I achieve that place of being the best in the island, then actually I'm quite happy with that. So actually it's massively about not just people who don't achieve a massive amount, but it's about people who achieve but also underachieve as well. And in a fixed mindset, it means you can be successful, but not ultimately as successful as you could be. OK, and in a growth mindset, it's about challenge. Because you believe you can get better, it's about taking a risk, taking yourself outside of your comfort zone, but believing that that's the way that you're going to learn and improve. Success is very much self-reference, so it's about how well you've done in relation to yourself, a whole personal best notion, which we hear a lot about in sport, but why not in education, why not in, in the rest of our lives? And failure isn't final. In a growth mindset, failure um, doesn't identify me as being a failure. It's something that I can learn from, okay? working out how I can improve next time. Potential in a growth mindset is not something I believe can be measured. Okay, how good I am now, or what I'm doing now, or how not so good I am now, is not a predictor of how I might be in the future. The success of others in a growth mindset is to be uh, celebrated and to be looked at as to, well, if they've achieved something, how can I do that myself? And effort and motivation is likely to be high because the belief that I can improve underpins that value of effort and, and motivation is going to come from that as well. And this all leads in a growth mindset to a greater sense of free will. If I believe I can change, I've got that internal locus of control, then it makes the whole world seem like 
well, the whole of life team, I think it was Shed some Ove said, I treat my life a bit like an experiment. Okay, that greater sense of free will. And for me, in a fixed mindset, I'm likely to end up with a deterministic view of the world. I'm going to kind of almost appear really helpless when something goes wrong. I can't do anything about it. I can't change. There's nothing I can do. And a lot of research now is starting to come out. It's still in its infancy, but there's research there um, about linking these um, implicit beliefs, the mindsets, to mental health and well-being. Because if you think about it, if you've got a greater sense of free will, you're more likely to have greater men uh, better mental health. And that deterministic view of the world, the sense that actually there's nothing I can do about it, this is how it is, and a fixed mindset, has been shown to um, have a correlation with a decrease in mental health and well-being, increased anxiety, for example, certainly less resilience, that, that coming back from failure and when things go wrong is far less evident in young people who've got, well, all of us, but the research in particular with young people is showing at the moment greater signs of mental, mental health difficulties. And we've been talking to people in Guernsey Mind about how we can link with them, and they've recognised this as being important in some of the research they've been doing um, in the education department, but also across the state generally, and also in other organisations. So hopefully we're going to be able to link with them and get the understanding of what growth mindset is out there across the community as well as just in schools. Okay, so importantly, it's what we actually do about it when we know about it. Um, what we've been doing, we've spoken to almost 3,000 people now across the island in various different settings from all of these different groups. Um, our aim has been not to tell them what to do within their specific context, but to help them develop a deep understanding of the research, how the different mindsets are created, and then support them through consultation in applying it to their, their individual context. Um, we've also been working off-island, um, which I think has been really helpful for us because it's given us that opportunity to stretch ourselves. So we've been working in America, um, had the opportunity to link with Philip Zimbardo, who's doing the Heroic Imagination Project. Um, we've also been working with two premiership football academies and three football league football academies looking at how they apply the theory into their everyday settings and bring it to life. Um, one of the most important statistics for us in terms of our work in education has been that 100% of teachers who've gone through the training have already changed one significant part of their teaching practice as a result. Okay, so as Jeremy said, it's about giving people a deep understanding of, of this concept, which on the face of it sounds quite straightforward and quite easy. And in some ways it is, but we know again, the more this is becoming out there, it's, it can be quite misinterpreted and applied very badly. And a bit like Chris said about the, the mindfulness in schools project, it's not, we've, we've not built it as an initiative. It's not something you do and then that's it, you move on to the next thing. It is very much about a way of being. It's about seeing the world through these different psychological lenses and trying to challenge yourself if you feel you've got a fixed mindset into, in, into having a growth mindset. We're all a mixture of both, okay? It's not about labelling people either or having a stick to beat people with, like, where's your growth mindset? It doesn't work like that. So with schools, and it's amazing how creative and innovative teachers in these environments are once they have a good understanding of what it is. So almost, number one, mindset's what they are. You don't have to talk about what they are if you do numbers two to ten well. Okay, so it's about creating a culture, an environment. Self-awareness is really, really key. If we can understand ourselves, what our beliefs are, where they might be holding us back, when we start getting defensive, when someone gives us a bit of feedback, okay, we think, oh, maybe we're, we're feeling a bit fixed about something here, and then challenge ourselves. That's where it's got to start. Uh, numbers three to ten, we're going to go through quite quickly with examples of things that are happening in our schools um, at the moment. Okay, so we'll bring it to life a bit with some some examples. Okay, so the first or third one, but the first one we're going to talk about. Um, if, I, if you hear me say, I can't do it, you're all going to say back to me. Yeah. Okay, really simple. So we have not yet monitors in classrooms, children responsible for stopping a class where they hear a teacher or anyone in there say, I can't do it. They get the whole class to talk back and say, yet. Yeah. I've even challenged in education department meetings when people say, I can't do something. There's me piping up, yet. Yeah. oh, there she goes again. But no, it's actually starting to have an impact. Um, this is an example of a school that was trying to look again at how it uh, fed back to parents at the end of year reports. And that top left-hand box, they had the word never in there to start with. And we were having a conversation. I said, well, why not change it to not yet? Okay. okay. Um, role models are really, really important. This is an example of Bob and Lola um, that was created in one of our primary schools by the head teacher. Bob said, I won't. Lola said, I can't. The head, head teacher went through a series of stories 
where Bob and Lola go on a bit of a journey, and by the end of the journey, Bob says I will, and Lola says I can. Um, and at the end of that um, process, of the end of the first year, Bob and Lola obviously went off with the year sixes to secondary school. The children reported back. They wrote 300 postcards, a postcard each, um, to Bob and Lola to say goodbye, and telling them what they'd learned from Bob and Lola. And it was real kind of goose pimple sort of stuff hair standing on end when you read from children saying, well, Bob and Lola taught me I don't have to be stupid. And this is Dima Duck. Dima Duck is one of several characters that some schools are introducing to very young children because if we can shape young children's beliefs from a very early stage to, to foster a growth mindset, we don't start have to teaching them explicitly about what the growth mindset is because that will just be their way of being. So Dima Duck here never gives up. Her friends, Cuba the Caterpillar, knows how to concentrate. Tim and Tina Tortoise, they cooperate. Okay, we've got curiosity, imagination. But these little cuddly toys come and sit on their desks. And they say, I'm going I'm to be determined like Dima Duck. We even have them. There was one, one teacher this last week was telling us that she was trying to parallel park into this car parking space. And she did it several times, eventually got in there. And a sort of six-year-old at the back said, Mummy, you didn't give up like Dima Duck. <laughs> okay, so, and we have Hamid the Hedgehog goes home and children, it's have a go Hamid and they try broccoli. So all these, these, these little stories that go with these characters, really, really powerful from a very young age. Um, for slightly older children, and for us adults as well, um, role models, again, people have been using the Star Wars, Darth Vader, Yoda as, as great ex um, examples of the fixed and growth mindset as well. The brain, okay? We know the brain is not fixed. Why should we be? Okay, one thing we don't really teach children is about the brain and how it works. Okay, why not? We've now got children talking about connecting their neurons, about making um, neural pathways. This is a, just a display from one of the schools, but there's lots of things going on around the brain. There's all sorts of videos children are being shown. We've got boys in particular get quite um, turned on by this brain idea. It's like, oh, my, I just haven't got strong enough links yet when they're trying to do their maths. And they know the more they practice, the stronger their brains are going to get, a bit like the muscles. Okay, helping people see what learning looks and feels like, understanding that it's not linear and that to learn something we have to go down into the pit. This is St Andrew's School before it closed. They took a wall and basically painted the pit of learning in it. Um, we also get children to draw their own learning journeys. And if you'll see up the right-hand side, there's a girl, who she's put all her self-talk up there. Um, so how it feels when she's in the pit of learning and she can't do something through to how she feels when she's finally accomplished it. And also a challenge on the left, helping children understand what level of challenge they might be. Challenge is really important and getting children to recognise that challenge is the only way in which they're going to learn. And that's going to be like making mistakes down in that pit, down in that, the bottom bit there. Um, fail, first attempt in learning, very simple acronym you'll see in a lot of classrooms over here as well now. Okay. I love this. We talk about the conscious and unconscious mind, and for a couple of reasons, this one in particular is about the messages out there which can kind of be subliminal, but sending the message of growth mindset. One school is having this as their school song. Okay, it drives you mad once you start hearing it because it just it goes round and round in your head, but how brilliant. The message is in this from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, but they're also going to have uh, uh, paintings of roses around the school. So you can imagine, I don't know, three, four, five years' time when they've actually left school, they see a rose or see a picture of a rose, it's perhaps going to trigger that thing in their mind, oh, I'm not going to give up, okay? Alexander Graham Bell, he knew, you know, he, did, he took failure, he kept going. Um, stickers, we've changed stickers, again, helping people to focus on the process of learning, the behaviours of a growth mindset, rather than telling people they're brilliant. Focusing on the process. So we know outcomes are important, and we're not saying outcomes aren't, but if you focus on the process, the process of learning is really important. The whole idea of personal best, personal improvement, not who is the best, but how much of you as an individual have improved and what ways have you done that is a, is a really key focus. Okay, we've worked with the department, they've created sports stories for kids based around personal best and the behaviours of a growth mindset. Every year seven has a copy of this book now and every teacher. Uh, we've put together a manual for coaches, which is in the process of being published at the moment, um, for uh, helping athletes in sp uh, across all different sports in particular. And this is the impact that's been reported across schools, businesses, sports, loads of different environments. And one just example I give on this, again, we were in a staff meeting last week um, getting feedback about the impact that they felt they had. And one teacher said, she said, mm, yeah, children are a lot less grumpy and miserable when they get something wrong. You just think, oh my God, the resilience is definitely improving. 
Okay, and just some next steps, things you can do. If you're interested, buy the book, Mindset, read it. Google Growth Mindset, in, then specific to your context you're working in. There is masses out there. Um, and then talk to others about what you think you are doing or you're not doing. Um, and then if you've got any questions, get in touch. Okay, we're available, we're on Ireland. Um, things you can do to help us, increase awareness through the media. We need to try and get the language out there as much as we possibly can, particularly into business in, as businesses um, and across the third sector. Um, we're trying to work with producing resources, so if anyone's got any expertise and wants to help out in producing resources, everything from stickers to videos, get in touch. Um, research, some researchers in the room, but again, trying to keep demonstrating the impact is really key. Um, and sponsorship. We're not sponsored at the moment, we're not doing any of the project that's sponsored. We're kind of, a lot of it we're doing out of our own free time, but we are getting a bit of support from education. But if anyone's interested in sponsoring, there is a wonderful opportunity. Thank, Thank you. you.